cerebral hemorrhage is uh, 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 simply defined as a spontaneous development of intraparenchymal hematoma due to rupture of uh, cerebral blood vessel. It is an important cause of uh, uh, acute stroke. It carries almost 15% of uh, acute stroke. Uh, the first one is ischemic stroke and the second one is hemorrhagic stroke. But uh, it is not simply a bleed in the brain. That's what the intracerebral hemorrhage should be considered as an important topic here because it causes uh, uh, increased morbidity for the survivors uh, of intracerebral hemorrhage and it uh, takes almost the mortality rate of about uh, 50%. Why it's happening? Because of two major re re reasons. The first one is uh, after a bleed, the blood which pooled within the brain parenchyma form an immediate hematoma formation. After a few, few, uh, one or two days, the late hematoma expansion, both these conditions are generally bad for the brain because it can cause increased intracranial pressure. In addition to increasing intracranial pressure, after a rupture, the blood vessel distilled to the arterial territory will slow down because there is some area is leaking out. So the distal area getting into the parenchyma related to distal area of the territory getting into ischemia and form an ischemic penumbra. And also it is considered a large economic burden to the society for by the survivors of intracranial hemorrhage. So in the first point, I like to highlight that the intracerebral hemorrhage is a devastating neurovascular disorder. So we want to find out what are the causes for these intracerebral hemorrhages. Simply, we can divide the causes into primary causes. There is a major causes, up to 80% of the causes which falls into primary causes and the secondary causes. In adults, chronic hypertension, uncontrolled chronic hypertension is the major cause. And the second cause is the amyloid angiopathy, cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Generally, it started increasing nowadays because of the aging population in Sri Lanka. And when you look at the diagram, you can see the pattern of bleed, which happens between chronic hypertensive bleed and cerebral amyloid angiopathy. When you look at the picture here, the cerebral amyloid angiopathy forming, forming micro bleeds, that's one key point. And second one is a lobar bleed. It's uh, occupied in the periphery and it is a lobar bleed. In contrast, the chronic hypertension, which forms very deep seated uh, bleeding. And uh, the secondary hemorrhages can be divided into hemorrhagic tumors, or it could be due to vascular malformation and coagulopathies. Generally, the adult, uh, older people, primary hypertensive bleed are the major causes. And in younger ages, the secondary co causes come to the, as a first cause. So young, hyper, young hemorrhagic strokes, less than 45 years, in one study, it shows the AV malformation as the first cause. And second cause, they most of the time it is idiopathic after routine investigations, they couldn't find the cause. And the, the hypertensive cause has come as a third major cause. So why the hypertensive bleed in young and old people produce such a bad outcome to the people? Why it's happening? So when you look at the neuroanatomy, there is a particular vulnerable artery, which is the major culprit for this bleed when the blood pressure in the systemic circulation increases. For example, if you take the middle cerebral artery, the first branch, M1 branch, the deep penetrating branches, for example, these branches, we call it as lenticulostriatal branches. These branches, which, which emerges from the medium-sized vessels, they are small vessels which emerge from the high-pressure system and which started supplying to the basal ganglion, such as caudate nucleus, putamen, and globus pallidum. So what's really happened when the blood pressure going uncontrolled? So when the autoregulations are overwhelmed, what would happen? The blood vessel wall get poor circulation and started thinning out and forming an aneurysm. These aneurysms are specifically named as charcot bochart's aneurysm. These aneurysms have a characteristic appearance of a discrete formation of aneurysms and it is mostly appear on the distal portion of the medium size or small size arterioles. When these aneurysms get rupture, they can get bleed. So when the blood pressure started rising, there's a pressure effect on the wall of the small and the medium size arterioles, which leads to rupture aneurysmal formation and bleed. So wh what are the sites where the penetrating blood vessels forming bunch of bleeds? There are certain areas which have been identified. The first common site of bleed is from lenticulostriatal branches, which is originating from the middle cerebral artery. 
that is B. And the second common site is the thalamogenicular branch from the posterior cerebral artery. And the third one is paramedian branches from the basilar artery and the fourth one from cerebellum, cerebellar arteries from cerebellum. So what is the clinical radiological presentation? How these patients present to us? Patient coming with uh, hemiparesis, headache, vomiting, drowsiness, or perhaps a dysarthria. When you do a CT, plain CT, you can find a few terminal or the uh, basal ganglion bleed. Whereas a patient who has prominent contralateral hemiparesis, vertical gaze palsy and decreased level of consciousness perhaps because in addition to headache or acute presentation, this must be a vascular event at the thalamus. So why the vertical gaze center if it is affected just because the midbrain just beneath the, the thalamus so it can give the pressure effect and can cause vertical gaze palsy and reticular uh, activating systems are connected with the thalamus so the drowsiness is a sign of thalamic bleed. In contrast, the cordy nucleus generally won't give remarkable neurological manifestation except erbulia. Erbulia is lack of motivation. And when, when, when we come to the pontine bleed, it is generally producing very bad bleed and high rate of mortality because the whole reticular networking system which is occupying in the pons causes a, a damage of this reticular system causing deep coma to the patient and the uh, pupil become very pinpointed and the pyramidal tracts get, get affected, they, can, they would have bilateral Babinskin sign. The horizontal gaze centers in the brain, uh, sorry, midbrain affected causing horizontal gaze palsy and sometimes facial uh, weakness as well. And the cerebellar lesions uh, produces trunchal latexia and they have typical occipital headaches and vomiting. However, the, compared to other areas, the surgical emergency generally arises from the cerebral, cerebellar hemorrhages. If cerebellar hemorrhage, which is more than three centimeters in, in size, we may have to call the neurosurgical team urgently because this hematoma can block the fourth ventricle and can cause obstructive hydrocephalus. So out of all hypertensive bleed, one area we are worried about uh, neurosurgical intervention is cerebellar bleed. So on the point two, I like to highlight chronic uncontrolled hypertension is the leading cause of ICH. And the second point I like to highlight, putamen is the most common site of hypertensive bleed followed by thalamic pontine and cerebellar arteries. So when I move to the second uh, common cause in older people, the people who are older than 60 years, they have 9% of chance of cerebral amyloidentropathy causing bleed. Whereas the people more than 90 years, they have 60% of chance of getting cerebral amyloid antibiotic bleed than younger people. So why the cerebral amyloid antibody happen? Because of deposition of amyloid beta peptide in small and medium sized vessels causing fibrinoid necrosis and aneurysm formation, as I mentioned in uh, hypertensive arterial, arterial bleed. So what are the common signs? Earlier I said it is a lower bleed and it can also cause micro bleeds in the periphery. In addition, the same beta pleated amyloid peptides can cause uh, uh, obstruction of the small vessels and can lead to leukoareosis, microinfarctions, and uh, sometimes the bleed get into the superficial area can cause superficial cirrhosis as well. So on MRI, we can clearly demonstrate these findings, the micro bleeds. So this is T2 eco gradient image, which shows micro dot-like bleed on the periphery of the uh, cerebra cerebrum. And also there's a large bleed, which is an extensive bleed. This is a hypo-intense lesion, which is a characteristic of blood, blood iron stain. And um, the small vessel disease are not visualized on these slides. So what is the prognosis of cerebral amyloid angiopathy? Generally, when compared to hypertensive ICH, they are better prognosis, but we have to worry a bit there because it has high chance of recurrence when compared to hypertensive bleed. So how can we prevent preventive measures? What we have to do? We have to avoid unnecessary antiplatelets administration for older people, anticoagulants, unless otherwise it is indicated. And also we have to advise the patients um, for false precautionary measures as well as ask them to control the blood, blood pressure because it may be coincidentally appear, uh, appearing in all people. So in uh, point four, I like to highlight definitive diagnosis of 
cerebral amyloid angiopathy. How can we diagnose? It is not only clinical radiological diagnosis. The histological diagnosis is the ideal one, but we can't make in each and every individual. So when the clinical suspicious raises, histopathological finding along with clinical radiological presentation is the diagnosis of cerebrovascular um, uh, hemorrhage. And uh, when we move to the second common cause, vascular malformation. Generally, the, the vascular malformation presents with seizures and unconscious. Sometimes it can cause young stroke because I mentioned secondary causes are more common in younger age, less than 45. Headache and death are more common due to AV malformation. There are two major types of uh, vascular malformations which have been identified as the common causes. One is arteriovenous malformation and the other one is cerebral cavernous malformation. The first one, arteriovenous malformation, they have direct connection between the high pressure system and the low pressure system. So high chance of getting bleed and death. When compared to the first one, second one is a capillary abnormality. So they have very low blood pressure. So chances of bleeding recurrences are much less. So when we take the cerebrovenous malformation, uh, the, as it is a low pressure, severe symptoms are less and benign cause. And plain CT that shows speckle appearance on the, uh, there's a hyperdense lesion with a little bit of speckle appearance. It is a feature, but we have to go for a T2 a GRE image on MRI. So what, what about the arteriovenous malformation? Arteriovenous malformation can firstly pick up on non-contrast CT brain. And the non-contrast CT brain might show a lump of mass, like uh, vermiform, like uh, 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 lesions in the cerebral hemisphere with dot, 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 like a calcification, that is hyperdensely areas. When we give the contrast to this brain, you can see very clearly the vermiform appearance and the one feeding vessels very much clear. So, but we can't well differentiate from where it's originating, where it's going to end. So for that, we have to do the CT angiogram. So CT angiogram, now we suppress all the parenchymal artifact and we see better visualizing this AV malformation where you can see enlarged feeding vessels and the needles in between and the draining uh, vein. So this all together, we call it as AV malformation. And further, the artifacts of the bone as well as the other parenchyma can be uh, subtracted and form a digital subtraction images on, M on D DSA. This DSA will clearly illustrating the feeding vessel and needles as well as um, draining uh, uh, veins. So this feature is more in favor of AV malformation. So what, what we talk about the imaging technology in intracerebral hemorrhage, non-control CT brain is a sensitive tool in detecting ICH. Digital subtraction image is a gold standard in diagnostic test for vascular malformation. Now we move to the less common, but it is, we can't say it's an uncommon cause of mycotic aneurysm in our part of region, that is uh, mycotic aneurysm. So this again can cause intracerebral bleed. Mycotic means it is infective, it is not fungal. It is what is the cause, as here mentioned, is a staphylococcus. The staphylococcus is a main culprit. Some studies demonstrated salmonella as well as, uh, as well a cause for this mycotic aneurysm. So infection of the blood vessels causing damage of the arteries and thinning of vessels and aneurysmal formation. That is a pathology for mycotic aneurysm. So where we suspect when the patient having risk factors, patient have chronic rheumatic heart disease or drug abuses or prosthetic arterial devices with fever and focal weakness and a headache, then we have to do a CT, they are, it shows hemorrhage, then we have to think about could be uh, in the mycotic aneurysm. So what is the test we want to do? Blood culture is the first one. As soon as patient admitted, we have to do the blood culture and the prompt arrangement should be made to arrange transesophageal echo. We no point in doing transthoracic echo to detect valvular vegetations because valvular vegetations are not very clearly identified on transthoracic echo. Transesophageal echo should be, down, uh, should be done as early as possible to confirm and proceed with the diagnosis. So in this ex, uh, uh, diagram, you can see the first one showing a plain CT that shows hyperdense irregular lesion with the hypodense areas, as well as some extension of hyperdensities in the intraventricular area, that is intraventricular hemorrhage, cerebral hemorrhage with some edema. And when we go for T2 gradient echo 
echo, there is a hyper intensity lesions which is a regular shape, the demarcation are well preserved and extended into intraventricular area. The intraventricular extension with this sort of things mostly in favor of some aneurysmal bleed. So when we proceed with the this DSA on oblique and lateral view, you can see the round area of mycotic aneurysm. Right. Now we move to the last course of secondary uh, uh, etiology of ICS, that is tumor bleed. Simply the tumor bleeds are divided into malignant or benign. The commonest malignant bleed is primary malignant bleed is due to glioblastoma multiforme and the lymphoma also can cause uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. Metastatic one, melanoma is the commonest one. Among benign condition, meningioma is the common one, hemangioblastoma also now reportedly common. So what is the sixth point I like to highlight is clinical presentation of ICH include acute weakness, headache, presence or absence of seizures and altered sensorium are the clinical clues to think about intracerebral hemorrhage. And it could be primary or secondary ICH. They should be investigated and managed according to underlying uh, etiology as well as severity. So how to evaluate the severity in the patients before considering the treatment? Simple A, B, C. What is A? Checking the alertness. Alertness in an ICH patient can be altered, decreased, or it can be increased, or it can be normal, sorry. Or the blood pressure can be normal, or sometimes, most of the time, it is increased. Guagulopathy and guagulopathy reversal. So when we assess the alertness, the most of the time, if it is a massive bleed, the alertness will be decreased. That is an alarming feature of acute mass effect. It, is, it, it indicates that the patient has high risk of mortality. So these kind of patients need to be monitored very carefully in an intensive care unit, and the continuous EEG monitoring is important. And if patient throws epilepsy seizures, then we have to treat with anti-epileptic drugs if continuous EEG is a positive, but patient did not have any clinical features of seizures, again, anti-epileptic drugs are indicated, but there's no need of prophylactic anti-epileptic therapy in all patients with ICH. And if mass effect is severe enough to cause compression, and then we have to go for um, initial medical management as hyperosmolar agents like 3% normal saline. And if it's severe enough, then we may have to refer to a neurosurgeon for uh, external ventricular drain. On the other hand, ICH and alertness well-preserved patients doesn't mean they are normal. No need, and those patients are not ready to transfer to medical general medical ward and discharge. Actually, these patients should be transferred to neurological intensive care unit for early management. And they have to keep under close monitoring for hematoma expansion. So how can we detect early a hematoma expansion if patient showing the first hemorrhage in, at the basal ganglion or intracerebral hemorrhage? So once we diagnose a patient with the alertness, good alertness, and having a hematoma, we have to administer with a CT angiogram. So if CT angiogram showing a tiny dot-like hyper-intense lesion, as here mentioned, there's a tiny dot in the middle, this is called spot sign. What spot sign? The punctate focus of contrast enhancing lesion. This indicates it is a dynamic hemorrhage. This patient is going to bleed further. So when we have to keep under observation this kind of patient, and when we monitor this patient after 24 hours of non-contrast CT, without medication, they would have expansion of hematoma. So how to deal with this uh, patient? We have to give rothrombin complex as a recommended treatment. Surgical evacuation uh, of hematoma. I, as I mentioned earlier, cerebellar hemorrhage of sufficient uh, size, three centimeter in diameter, causing obstruction of fourth ventricle and CSF flow, of flow block is the reason for evacuation. So craniotomy and evacuation is one method of um, uh, uh, doing a surgical procedure, but better results uh, with endoscopic evacuation uh, has found out than craniotomy and evacuation. However, the later studies have showed a limited benefit on it. So how the blood pressure control? A, I have discussed alertness. B, blood pressure control. So the blood pressure control is a little bit tricky because elevated blood pressure is the most common risk factor for ICH. 
and also once the start, once the patient getting into bleed acute elevated blood pressure is common for most of the ICH and also it is said that the acute hypertension following a bleed is a major drive for hematoma expansion so what is the conclusion out of this we have to treat aggressively the elevated blood pressure to stop or to reduce the bleed which is happened in the meantime we have to avoid inducing hypotension on this patient. So various studies have been done to control the, to find out what is the target blood pressure in ICH. But none of the studies concluded with a good evidence. So the targeted blood pressure now is put in the range. The minimum of 120, maximum of 160. So we have to bring down the blood pressure between 120 to 160 systolic pressure. Still, we don't know what is the diastolic pressure, optimal diastolic pressure for ICH. So what are the drugs which can be administered for, to control the blood, blood pressure, acutely elevated blood pressure? Fast acting triatable agent. So it is a level one study shows nicodipine is the ideal one. However, we generally try some other drugs. These are the drugs which should not be given as an high, in a hypertensive crisis related to ICH, such as hydralazine, nitroprusside, and nitroglycerin, because these drugs causes vasodilatation and raising intracranial pressure and causes bad effect to ICH and acute hypertension. So the point eight emphasizes the target systolic blood pressure range, range in ag aggressive blood pressure management to prevent hematoma ex expansion is 120 to 160 at the early management, not at the last stage. Eighth, last one, coagulopathy reversal. So if patient doesn't have any coagulation abnormality, if APTT is normal and uh, full blood count and platelets, clotting time, bleeding times are normal, then no need of pro-coagulant therapy for acute ICH. But the patient with coagulopathy abnormality, pro-coagulants or reversal of uh, agents are mandatory. So anticoagulants uh, related to ICH, uh, it should be identify the anticoagulants and treat the reversible agent in addition to controlling the blood pressure. We have to go hand to hand with the controlling blood pressure as well as anticoagulants should be administered. So what are the anticoagulants which we can give? One is prothrombin complex, k -centra. So it is not the level one evidence to suggest that the case entry is a very good drug for hypertensive bleed. No, it is it, it, case entry is a factor, uh, vitamin K dependent clotting factors concentrate. So it achieves fast reversal of warfarin related bleed and a low risk of volume overload when compared to fresh frozen plasma. And it, is, it showed a positive effect on hypertensive ICH when the spot sign on CT angiogram is evident. But it is not yet randomized. And however, we don't know whether FFV versus k centra, which is better, we don't know really. And risk of antiplatelet, continuing antiplatelet therapy during intracerebral hemorrhage is unclear. So when we can give platelet therapy, can we give all the patients with platelet therapy? No. There are only two indications which have been given as a platelet transfusion in intracerebral hemorrhage. One is thrombocytopenia with the platelets less than 50,000. And the other one, a patient who has been taking on antiplatelets and needed urgent surgical intervention, yes, on table platelet transfusion as hematologist suggested should be given. The other uh, medication is desmopressin. Uh, that is only useful when the patient has severe uricemia and need an acute uh, surgical intervention. Yes, we can give the medication. So the point nine emphasize the choice of coagulopathy reversal should be made based on the clinical context of the patient. So what is a long-term plan? Once a cerebral, intracerebral hemorrhage has been treated, how can we discharge? If patient already on antiplatelets and anticoagulant, how can we restart? No, there is no clinical evidence when to start, what is the date to start. So we have to have a candid clinical assessment and um, say this patient is now safe and can start. So it is individualized. And patient with obstructive hydrocephalus initially can be put on EVD, but if patient's uh, EVD removal causing problem, then we have to put the patient on PP shunt as well. And on long-term follow-up of these uh, intracerebral hemorrhage patients out of uh, 170% of patients get into vascular dementia. So we have to clearly monitor these patients with the Monreal assessment to find out any evidence of vascular dementia and we may have to uh, give good advice to the caregivers.
So prognostication. So it is very important at the beginning. Important because the uh, patients with admitted with intracerebral hemorrhage at the onset, you have to evaluate and prognosticate. So there is a scoring system that is called as ICH scoring system. It has five major components. One is size of the hemorrhage at the time of admission, age, Glasgow coma scale, and the location of hemorrhage, that is infratentorial or supratentorial, and presence or absence of intraventricular hemorrhage. So if the score is high, the outcome is bad. And the other factors, uh, the, generally the factors which we considered as a leading cause of bad prognosis are early neurological deterioration. The second one is a deep seated uh, hemorrhage, especially the bleeding over the thalamus. And if basal um, functional status is very low and advanced age, generally we consider as a low prognostic factors. So the 10th point emphasize due to significant mobility and mortality related to ICH, assessment of patient's prognosis with reasonable accuracy is important. So I have uh, uh, summarized with 10 pearls at, this, at the end. Intracerebral hemorrhage is a devastating neurovascular disorder and it is a chronic heart control hypertension is a leading cause of uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. Putamen is the common site of intracerebral bleed. The definitive diagnosis of cerebral amyloid angiopathy is uh, histopathology along with uh, neuro -clinical uh, radio clinical management. non control CT is the sensitive test uh, to detect intracerebral hemorrhage. Vascular abnormality uh, detection can be made by a digital subtraction image in a, as it's a gold standard in diagnosis. The cardinal clinical features of ICH are acute weakness, stroke-like event, and patient headache as well as uh, uh, seizure disorders. Management of ICH include assessment of alertness, blood pressure monitoring, and assessment of coagulopathy. And systolic uh, blood pressure maintenance should be done between 120 to 116. And choice of coagulopathy and reversal is individualized. Prognostication should be done at the, at, at the time of admission. With that, I would like to conclude the talk.